ナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナモアミダブツナ
when you get into physics, it almost becomes philosophy a, a, after a certain point. And he was uh, the teacher that would always come up with questions and what, like things like, I better not do this because I think he's going to get it on the recording. Yeah, but he would jump up in the air. And then he would say, now tell me, did the earth move or did I move? Right? And it's almost philosoph uh, philosophical, right? And, and so phys I've always had a, an interest with, with physics. And so tonight, what I'm going to do is, first of all, let me just open this up. Now, what I've handed out to you, the, the handout you have is sort of just a, a background or, or uh, what you have in your handout basically will be covering on the slide. So you don't really have to follow your handout. You could keep, that's for your reference afterwards, okay? Um, but what we're going to do today is, first of all, I am, gonna, I am introducing the, the workshop, okay? Um, what is quantum phys physics? I'm going to give you just a brief introduction. As I said, I'm not a physicist. So I, I, there might be things I say that, that are not 100% accurate, perhaps. But I think overall, fairly accurate. And what's interesting is that I think there's some things about quantum physics that we can apply to Buddhism. Okay? And so I'm going to be showing you how um, that parallels with Buddhism. Is it me or is it out of focus? Maybe it's just the way it is. Does it get any better? No. Nope. Well, I guess that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, and then part two. Now, some of you who were at the Fraser Valley Buddhist Temple, um, who was that that we went with the Dharma school and we had the little discussion, remember? I introduced this part, uh, part of this. Okay, so we'll, uh, I'm going to introduce this again briefly and then finally um, introduce more of the pure land, the Jodo Shinshu, the, the, the background and examining Shinan Shon. Okay? So, that being said, let's get started with what is quantum physics. Okay? Now, you, you all know uh, what physics is all about? Yes? No? It, physics talks a lot about energy. How things work, basically, is what physics is all about. Okay? How things work in the, uh, in the universe. And we have what, uh, what we call classical physics. And, and that's, you know, like the whole idea of Isaac, Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton and the apple falling. And I, I've read that, in fact, it, the apple did not fall on his head. That's a, an old fable. But he did see an apple fall, and that helped him come up with this formulation okay, of, of gravity. Right? And interestingly enough, oh, is this, I don't know, it seems to be going in and out. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, when you start thinking about science, uh, in our 20th century, um, 21st century, science has become almost like an absolute truth. But the more you look at science, the more you realize there's nothing absolute about it. And there's a lot of contradictions in science. Okay. One of the interesting contradictions has to do with this, uh, th this uh, idea of gravity. right? Because on one hand, they talk about gravity is the attraction of masses. That all things have a mass and that they attract one another. And the larger the, the uh, object or the denser the object, the more gra gravitational pull it has. So on one hand, they're talking about everything attracting, yet at the same time, science also says the universe is constantly expanding, which seems to be a contradiction, right? That on one hand, they're uh, expanding, and yet they're saying everything is attracting. So n the science itself is not an absolute. There are a lot of things about science that are postulations and theories, right? Um, <clears throat> so we begin to look at, first of all, very basically, what is matter? What is matter, right? How would you define matter? Ben, you look like you, you're good at this kind of thing. How would you define matter? Well, I guess uh, on the first class, I think of matter is something that's solid, like a table or whatever. 
Okay, that's one level. And then we, if we break that down a little further, it's most of the matter is made up of air. Well, space, really. When you well, we look at we go down to atoms, right? The 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 the, the smallest, or well, what we classically think is the smallest thing. And when you look at an atom, and this is another thing about interesting about science, is that over 90, 90% of an atom is actually air. Because they, they, they say, you know, you have a neutron, you have a proton, and then you have what these electrons that are going around, right? But in fact, the majority of it is space, they're saying. Right? Because they, you can't pinpoint where the electrons are, but it sort of moves around and that sort of thing. So uh, when you think about that, then you begin to think, well, that's interesting, because in Buddhism, right, um, if, if you look at the Heart Sutra, for instance, right, uh, they talk about uh, this idea of sunyata, emptiness, right? Form is not form, right? Uh, so even though we have form, there's this ku, emptiness, right? So we begin to see, okay, what this thing that we call matter. So classically, we break it down to, to, to atoms and and then we break down the atom further and you could break it down into its components. Well, along the way they came up, the uh, physicists realized that light comes in bundles and they call these photons. And this is where quantum physics started uh, getting its birth. And it, it, this is where things started getting really wacko, crazy, because what they did, there was an experiment that was done where um, they had a source that was emitting these photons, okay? bundles of packets of light. And then they had uh, a screen with one slit in the middle. And they randomly shot these photons through. And then they had a wall on the other side. And when they did this with the one slit, it reacted as particles would react. Basically, what happened was they said that you, know, there, you have a highest concentration of photons that were hitting the center. And slowly, fewer were hitting the outside. And this is typical of what they expected with particles, to how they behave. Okay. So this is what, yeah. Now, something happens that's quite different if it's not a particle but a wave, okay? What happens with a wave is that when you hit a spot like that, then it curves around like this, okay? Now what happens, what's interesting, is that if you have two slits in here, if you open this up with two slits, okay. if you have a divider with two slits in it, and you sh shoot the photons through, okay, from a particle aspect, what you should see on this wall here, is two areas of high concentration where the majority of it hits and fewer as it goes out, like that, okay? But when they did this photon with the two slits, it didn't happen like that. What actually happened was they got something that looked like this. And what this is, is that when two waves meet, okay, the way waves work is that if two waves hit, both the crests come together, the amplitude is increased. But if a crest and a trough meet at a certain space, it cancels one another out. So they got this pattern along the wall that was saying it was waves, not particles. This, the pattern that they got was very typical of what you see when two waves are going through with the curvatures. And they, some, some places 
it's amplified in some places it's it's not uh, it's canceled out okay it's very different from just seeing a pattern where you have two centers of concentration so then they were saying well what is it is it a wave is it a particle and basically what the quantum mechanics said is that every single thing has two aspects to it both a particle aspect as well as a wave aspect. And so now quantum physics says that we are all waves as well. Although we're physical, we're also waves. And, and how they define waves is that waves have different amplitudes and lengths, and so some of the, these waves are, we can't see it as a wave because it's, because it's so long or it's, so high in frequency, etc. But regardless, what they're saying is there's a, a very concrete aspect, aspect as well as more of an abstract aspect. Okay? And this is where I think the application to Buddhism comes in, because Buddhism also has a very concrete aspect as well as a very metaphysical aspect. Okay? So if we look at it in that sense, just that it's very easy for us to understand this particles, okay? Because we can see it and say, okay, well, that makes sense, right? But then when you start saying, well, you're also waves, then you sort of, you have to bend your mind a bit because you can't think, what do you mean we're waves, you know? There has to be something that moves in that wave. You know, what is it? But in fact, if you look at a wave, the particles don't move. And if you follow a wave, if you had an ocean, and you follow waves that look like this, right? It looks like there's movement, but if you had a particle here, in actuality, the particles are just doing this in one spot, okay? And, and the, the wave, there is motion, apparent motion, but it's not, it's, it's transference of energy is what it is. So, with this, if we look at Buddhism from this very, having on one hand a very concrete aspect and on the other hand a very abstract aspect, okay? Then what we have to do is we have to go to the beginning and we introduce the beginning, the dynamics of Shakyamuni's teachings, Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. And we go right to the very beginning, the Four Noble Truths. And there are other things like the poison arrow par parable versus what we call the three pure land sutras. So I'm going to just introduce that briefly now. And uh, the, uh, I was, I thought maybe Roy might be here tonight, so I just brought this. Uh, um, of course, we all know that the the place that the the historical Buddha attained enlightenment was a place called Buddha Gaya in uh, North, uh, Bihar, the north, northern part of India. And uh, we, a group of us went there in year 2000, and here's a picture of us. There's Roy right there, actually. I thought he might be here, so I put this in there. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the Buddha attained enlightenment in this place called Buddha Gaya. And right now there's a temple there called the Mahabodhi Temple. And then from there, he went in search of... Um, uh, he went to a place called Sarna. And this is a place about 100, 100, 150 kilometers away from uh, Buddha Gaya. Maybe it wasn't that far. I have my distance mixed up. But um, when the Buddha, prior to attaining enlightenment, he had practiced ascetic practices for six years. And he was practicing with five mountain ascetics. And he realized that the life of the ascetic, where they try to cleanse their, their bodies of their uh, fetters and their, their impurities by doing mortification. And Shakyamuni realized this was not the way. And this is where he came to what we call the middle path. Because before that, prior to that, for 29 years as a prince, he had all the things that you can imagine, hope for, right? 
So he realized that that wasn't the way either. And he came to a conclusion of what we call the middle path, neither extremes. And then the first person, the first people he sought out after he attained enlightenment was the five mendicants who had been practicing with him for six years. What had happened was, after doing this for six years, Shakyamuni or Siddhartha at that time realized this is not the way. And he received a, a bowl of rice porridge from a, a, a maiden by the name of Sujata. And he meditated under the Bodhi tree. And when those mendicants saw him take the rice porridge from Sujata, they, they gave up on him saying, oh, he's lost the way. And they left him. And they went to this place called Sarna. So afterwards, Shakyamuni sought them out. And they were the first to become his disciples. Okay. And, and this was a place called Sarnath. There's, there's a place there called uh, Deer Park. It's very famous. There's a lot of deers there. Okay. A lot of deer there. Like deer, you don't say deers, right? Deer. Deer. There's a lot of deer there. Okay. Anyway, so there he began his first of his, or his Four Noble Truths, right? And if you examine this Four Noble Truths, it's very interesting. Um, you have you know, the, tru the truth of suffering, first of the Four Noble Truths. The second is the truth of causation of suffering. The third is the truth of cessation of suffering. And fourth, of course, truth of path to the cessation of suffering, right? A lot of this is a review for, I think, many of you. The truth of suffering, of course, the first of the suffering, you know, the four great sufferings in life, birth, old age, sickness, and death. Now, what I want you to keep in mind, and I'll come back to this again, is in particular the first one and the fourth one, birth, death. Okay, this is a, it comes up to be a recurring topic in Buddhism. And I will uh, come back to this again later on as well. But let me just keep this up here. Birth, death, right? <coughs> okay, and he also talked about other sufferings. We call these uh, four auxiliary sufferings, having to part with loved ones, uh, if the cause and conditions exist, having to meet someone you dislike, not getting what we desire, and attachment to our body and environment around us. You've, you've probably all heard these things, right? Um, I've explained this in, in numerous settings, but, you know, the, it, of course, these are, what are very major sufferings, but these also occur on a daily basis, right? And I, um, the example I use is when having to part with loved ones. Of course, traditionally, that's at the time of death, but um, when I tell my son to get off the Facebook, because he's been on long enough, right? He starts immediately, he doesn't get off right away, he starts typing furiously. And I'm sure he's saying to his friend, my wonderful father is calling me now, <laughs> yeah, right? Probably not. He's got all these exclamation marks and, you know, funny little signs and <laughs> things I can't repeat here, probably. But he's telling his friends. I'm experiencing suffering, right? That's what he's doing. He said, I have to go now. I don't want to go, but I have to go. So he's expressing that. Having to meet someone you dislike, this happens all the time, right? Whether it's in the marriage, whether it's in classrooms, um, that happens. And not getting what we desire, right? You've seen the commercials, right? Just imagine. Cells because we, 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 we were never satisfied. And finally, our, our attachment to our body and environment around us. And I've mentioned this before, too. Right? When, when you're young, it's the vanity of you know, getting a pimple on Friday night, the anxiety from that. But as you get older, it's the loss of hair. It's the graying of hair. Right? Right? All of us. It's a suffering, right? Attachment to our, our appearances, right? 
So then that was the first of the Four Noble Truths. And the Buddha continued on and said, well, let's examine that. Why, why are they suffering? And they suffer because he says, because we are not able to um, accept things as they are. Right? Um, basically, the three Dharma seals tells us that all phenomenal events are impermanent. It is a result of causes and conditions. Okay? When the cause and conditions no longer exist, then the phenomenal event will cease to be. It's a very, very clear statement. Nonetheless, it's not easy to accept. Right? Um, when we want something, impermanence is neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. But sometimes it could be good if we're in a bad situation and it goes good relative to us. That impermanence we like. Conversely, if we're in a good position, then we don't like the impermanence that says we're no longer in that same position. Okay? We have difficulty with that. Oh, and I've shown this before too. So you probably saw this. You know, this is the uh, Calvin and Hobbes where he says, nothing is permanent, everything changes. That's the one thing we know for sure in this world, uh, but I'm still going to gripe over it, right? Still going to cry? Yeah, I'm going to still gripe about it. Um, there is no such thing as a permanent independent self. This is saying that we're all interconnected. And understanding this is the underlying uh, cause of, of trying to get over this. If we understand truly that we're interdependent, then we be begin to see that change is just changing dynamics, that we're still part of this interconnection. And finally, nirvana is the extinguishing of flames of passion. That all, underlying all this, there is a, a calmness and a, a, what we call the truth of cessation of suffering. And that nirvana is quiescent. So it's not necessarily when we attain that awakening, it's not a euphoric, you know, hallelujah type thing, but it is what it is. You accept things for what it is. Okay. And one of the, my favorite quotes, and I've mentioned this one to some of uh, those who attended some of my other talks, the thing about uh, a human being is part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest. A kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affections for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And you know whose quote this is, right? Any guess? Very nice quote. Don't you agree? Yeah. Okay. And if we can understand this, uh, it will help us out. But if all the people who said it, it was this guy, right? Physics and Buddhism bringing it together again. Basically, okay. Um, if we can understand or get to that point where we're transcending the suffering, you'll have this peace. Right? And how the Buddha recommended that we go to that is what we call the path, path to cessation of suffering. And there's what we call the eight, eight Noble Eightfold Path. And if you look at, oops, yeah, okay. If you look on your handouts, I can't remember which page that was, there's a uh, right, I've <clears throat> broken this down a little bit more. We kind of sometimes wonder what all these are. Right views. Okay, the first one, right view, whether you're, you're understanding, first of all, of what they call the Four Noble Truths. Um, your views have to have either a wholesome or unwholesome a root to it. Right thoughts, there are four questions that you could be asking yourself. Are you sure about what you're doing? What am I doing? Is this 
what we call habit energy. Okay, what I'm doing is it creating a positive habit? Is it creating a negative habit? Am I cultivating bodhicitta? That's the uh, uh, the desire to be to attain enlightenment. Am I creating that? Right speech, speak truthfully, do not speak with forked tongue, do not speak cruelties, and do not exaggerate or embellish. Right action is a reverence for life, generosity, sexual responsibility, mindful consumption. Right livelihood, engage in livelihood that will not harm other living beings. Right effort, now this is an interesting one. Need to know what is, what is the proper effort. And I've written here, Buddha and Sona. Uh, Sona was a, a disciple of the Buddha, uh, who was previous in a previous life or previous to becoming a disciple was a musician. And in one di one discussion that he had with the Buddha, one day the Buddha asked Sona. He said, "You were a musician in your in your previous existence." He asked him, "What would happen, or if you have a mis musical instrument?" and you uh, struck the note or the, the, the chord that was not strung or strung too loosely, what would happen? And so I said, you won't get a sound. Or it might sound very, very um, off key. And then the Buddha said, well, what would happen if you had Happy New Year? <laughs> if you had an instrument where the string was strung too taut. And Sona said, the string would break. And the Buddha said, exactly. So with right effort, it meant finding that right balance of not being too taut and not being too loose. Okay. And finally, um, <clears throat> right concentration or right mindfulness. Okay. Focusing on, on where you are, what you are doing. Uh, when it comes to mindfulness, in, 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 incidentally, I've written down here about um, what we call Nem Butsu, uh, the recitation of the name of the Buddha. But Nem Butsu, interestingly enough, this character, if you break down the character, the first character, Nen, is made up of two halves. <coughs> and I've written it down there. You see that first half is sort of looks like a house on top with uh, the one that looks like this, right? Okay. That character is a character for now, right? And then the other one it, beside it is this character here, which when you put it underneath, that becomes Nen. But that is Kokoro, which is heart or mind. So now, heart or mind, Buddha. So Nen Butsu, or Nian Fo in Chinese, is when the, the Buddha is in my heart or mind now. Okay? And so that is the, what we call the right mindfulness. Mind, mindfulness of mind, mindfulness of body, mindfulness of body and environment. Now if we examine this Four Noble Truth, reviewing it again, you begin to see that it's very, very concrete. It says, here's suffering. Okay. Examine why we suffer. Here's something other than suffering. And how do you get there? Right? Very, very concrete. For no, uh, the eight, or Noble Eightfold Path. How to live your life. That's what it is. It's a guide to how, you, how to live your life. No? You're shaking your head. What? <laughs> it's just, it's not that simple. Well, it's not simple, but it, it is. I mean, to actually follow it is not that simple. Very systematic. But it's very systematic, and it is, it, it's telling us, you know, if you, do, if you lead this life, this will be a pathway to uh, decrease your suffering. Okay? So that, to me, is more the very particle or concrete teaching of Buddhism. Okay. And the Buddha, okay, if we go 
to the next one, which is the poison arrow parable. Okay? Now, in his teachings, or amongst his followers, there were individuals who began questioning things. And there was one fellow by the name of Marunkaputta. Marunkap. I can't remember the, all these names myself. Marunkaputta. Anyways, this uh, fellow by the name of Marunkaputta started, th he was meditating one day and he started thinking of all these things. What we would consider maybe more metaphysical. And he started thinking about where did I come from? Where am I going to go after I die? <laughs> How was the universe started? All this kind of question. Right? So he had all these questions and he uh, approached the Buddha and he said, Listen, I'm, I've been your disciple for a while and I've started to have all these questions. And I'm afraid if you can't answer these questions, I may have to go elsewhere to find the answers. So the Buddha begins by saying, Well, let me ask you this. When you joined the Sangha, when you joined the Brotherhood, did I promise you that I would tell you where you're going to go when you die? Where you came from before you were born? And he says, no. And he says, but I have these questions now. Can you answer them? And the Buddha then goes on to give this parable of what we call a poison arrow. And he says, suppose there was a traveler Right? And this traveler is shot by an arrow, a poison arrow. And the doctor and, and the, those around him come to his aid to help him. But before they can pull the arrow out of his chest, this traveler says, wait, before you pull this arrow out, I need to know certain things. I need to know what form of being shot this arrow. Was it a man? Was it a female? You know, what, what class did they come from? It's all written here. I'm not saying exactly word for word, I'm sorry, paraphrasing things, okay. But he says, you know, I need to know what kind of arrow, or what the, the, the string of the bow, what kind of bow it was made out of, the quills of the, the, the arrow, where, what kind of bird it came from, what kind of poison was on that tip. Suppose he asked all these questions, but it says, what would happen to this traveler? And of course, the disciple, Marun um, Putta says, he would, of course, die. And the Buddha said, exactly. He said, there are certain questions you can ask that won't help you in understanding or solving the suffering you're encountering. And whether you find out the, the, where you're going after you die, those are, the, those are irrelevant, the Buddha says, okay? In this, in this one parable. So he's being very concrete. He's, he's telling them, you know, don't worry about what's going to happen down there. If you take care of what you're doing right now, right here, everything will resolve itself, take care of itself down the road. If you're conscious of what you're doing right now, that's the most important thing. And this goes hand in hand with what this Four Noble Truth would say, right, basically. If you follow this path, you don't have to, things that will resolve itself. You will be able to rid yourself of your suffering. Okay? That being said, why is there such a thing called the, Amida, the, the teachings on what we call Amida Buddha? If the Buddha has been, um, if Shakyamuni is saying, well, you don't have to worry about the future, it'll resolve itself, worry about what you're doing right now, then he has, what's with all this? Because when we look at the, the Amida Sutras, the three teachings on Amida, they're talking about what happens after life, right? The very question that the uh, Malunka Putta was asking, you know, where am I going to go after life, right? And yet on one hand, the Buddha is saying, oh, no, you don't have to worry about that stuff right now. Focus in on, on the present. And yet, there is a whole series of scriptures that talk about what happens or where we're going. And I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind, and this is where I come back to this, okay, one of the fundamental teachings was it is a teaching 
to what we call transcend the cycle of birth death. To trans and go beyond that. And this is where we get into this whole ideology of Amida Buddha. Okay. And this is where we start getting into more of what, we, what I consider the wave aspect of Buddhism. It's not necessarily so concrete. And the reason why you need this aspect as well is because, as was so. Uh, aptly pointed out by Joanne, it's not necessarily enough with just live your life, do this, and you'll be fine. Because it's much more complicated than that. Okay. Um, and there is a um, famous painting, and this is attributed to uh, uh, Shan Tao, Zendo Daishi. Okay? He, wrote, he wrote this whole thing on, uh, we call this uh, Un, Unyu, which is the uh, cloud and the dragon in the cloud. Uh, now, this diagram is actually quite evident. You can see the, the dragon quite clearly. But in fact, in, in many of these um, paintings of this dragon in the cloud, you might just see the eye of the dragon. Okay? And the point is to um, understand that there's both a surface meaning and a deeper meaning to the teachings of Buddhism. Okay? And even with the, the three Pure Land teachings, there are surface meanings and a much deeper meaning. And they're all pointing to uh, the main focus, which is the larger sutra on Amida. But I'm not going to... Well, maybe I'll get into it a little bit afterwards. But um, what's important to know in the Buddha's teachings is that he goes on to say, and in one of his teachings, which is this thing called Taiki Seppo, okay, concept of spreading the Dharma according to the listener. Um, <clears throat> In the uh, Mahaparinirvana Sutra, this is the, the, one of the last teachings of the Buddha before he passed away. He has a talk with one of his ten great disciples, Kashapa. And Kashapa questions the Buddha. He says, World Honor One, you taught us previously that the mind of faith is, is the path. And at another time, the non-negligence is the path. <clears throat> In like manner, you told us that endeavor, concentration, contemplation, and the uh, contemplation of the impurity of the flesh, reflection on universal impermanence, the upholding of precepts, association with good characters, the practice of uh, compassion, destroying defilements by the power of insight, and so on. Every one of these is the path. The world on now has introduced the Eightfold Noble Path as the contents of the path. Is it then that all the teachings that the world on the one previously taught are false? So he questions. He says, in the end, he comes back to this Eightfold Noble Path. And the Buddha says, you know, the, you have to follow this path. And so Keshapa says, well, what about all those other things that you were saying? Is that all false or should we not follow that? And then <clears throat> the world honored one praised Keshapa saying, well, ask, O Keshapa. All these teachings defined as paths are equally included in the truth of the path. O sons of good family, though the path is only one, the Buddha has explained it differently in accordance with the capacities of various people. Even though the nature of fire is one, when it burns wood, we call it wood fire. When it burns grass, we call it grass fire. Also as to one and the same thing, we call it color in the aspect we see, or we call it smell. And whatever we can taste, we call it taste. It is the same with the singular path of the Buddha. Just for the sake of edifying varieties of people, it is explained in a variety of ways. It is only through these skillful means that countless people can eventually be led to overcome the cause of delusion. So ultimately, in order to get to transcending the cycle of birth and death, Buddha says, I've taught it in different ways 
depending on the capacity of the individuals. Okay. So coming to this point now, now that we're doing this, we're, we're understanding that there is different aspects to the teachings. There's a very concrete, very um, physical aspect. Follow this path and you'll be free from suffering. And then there's also this other much more metaphysical. Okay? And this is where the whole idea of uh, the Pure Land teachings come in. Okay? Now, in order to understand that, <coughs> I have brought in, first of all, uh, that uh, in I introduced briefly in Fraser Valley, and I'm going to do it again today, that there was this um, book that I've recently read by this author, Seiki Hazama. Very interesting book. Jodo okay. Shinshi um, for the 22nd century. Jodo right. Shinshi for 22nd. You might think, well, we're in the 21st century. Why are we talking about Jodo Shinshi for 22nd century? And according to uh, Hazama Sensei, he says, we're talking about 22nd century is because it'll take about 100 years to really change things. And we have to start now in order to be prepared for the 22nd century. Okay. And he talks about having attended uh, a wedding of uh, a local temple minister, young minister. And at that wedding, one of the members gave a, uh, a speech. And he asked this young minister to keep in mind of three things. Right? So first of all, see the true reality of the present situation regarding Buddhist membership. Right? Think of the, uh, understand what, where the members are at. Now he was talking about, he was using the example of Japan. And what he was mentioning there was that um, in Japan, most of the, particularly younger generation, if you ask them what religion you belong to, most of them will be able to tell you, well, I'm a Buddhist. Okay. Or my family belongs to Buddhism. Okay. If you went any further than that and you asked them, well, what denomination of Buddhism do you belong to? What school of Buddhism do you belong to? They have absolutely no idea. Okay. And they don't even know anything about teachings of the Buddha. So he said that's the present situation. So be very cognizant of that. And he said, uh, um, Number two is that, as a minister, you have to be an example to the people. Okay? And, and uh, basically, live up to what you teach. And finally, he says, please further your, your studies, because we have to teach it in a way that is understandable. Okay? And this was one of the drawbacks, he was saying, about the Pure Land teachings right now. And he mentioned that, the, that he had joined a group of uh, 25 individuals from uh, Japan that came to North America in 1981. And in their journey in California, they went to a temple there, um, the El Ukon Buddhist Temple, Buddhist Church, and they were talking. They had a gathering. And he was talking with some of the younger people. And one young individual made up this point. He said, um, Uh, he was saying, at that time, there was an individual who stated that many of the younger generation who attended both Dharma school as well as YBA converted to Christianity once they became adults. When he was asked why he thought this trend was happening, he replied, well, Jozo Shinshi tends to focus on what happens after one passed away, while Christianity seems to focus on how to live one's life today. Okay? So, the way that the Jodo Shinshi has been presented for many, many generations now is that it's concerned only with the afterlife and not present life. How do I live my life? That was the impression that this young person had. And it's true, we talk about going to the Pure Land and etc., etc. And so, how do we deal with that? Okay, another 
Professor Ken Tanaka um, also mentioned that th those who are becoming interested in Buddhism in North America are interested in other avenues of Buddhism and not necessarily Jodo Shinshu because they're dealing more with things like and these are what we call the converts who are more oriented on practice, how to live my life today. Okay? And those are the ones that tend to go towards or migrate towards Zen Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism. Okay? It's focusing on more the uh, mental health aspects as opposed to, say, uh, Pure Land Buddhism, where it's, it appears to be talking about this Pure Land and Amida Buddha and all that. Um, so these are problems or issues that we have to deal with, which comes to the point of what I do with it. I see that some of you are getting probably pretty sleepy or tired around now. And I had, what did I do with that? There was a questionnaire. Oh, maybe it's here. Hmm? Where did I, where did I go? I'm missing some pages somewhere. Maybe it's in the bottom. There. Ah, here it is. Now, I guess maybe we could just talk, talk on this openly here. Well, th those are questions that you can look at, but uh, there are three different questions, okay? First of all, what is your reason for coming out this evening? Any? Oh, well, thank you. I'm flattered, okay, but yes? With Buddhism. Okay. To hear the Dharma. What does that mean? Listen to stories. Okay. Any other comments on that first one? What is your reason for coming here? Learn more about. Jodo Shinshu and learn more about Buddhism. Okay, so if we want to learn more about Jodo Shinshu, if we want to learn more about Buddhism, okay, ultimately what we have to come to, well, we'll continue on with the next question. Okay. What does this phrase mean to you? Teaching which transcends a cycle of birth death. Does that mean anything to you? We hear in uh, the founder of Jodo Shinshu in his teaching, Shinashon, he talks often about uh, being sinking in the ocean of birth and death. And, says, uh, and the Buddha's teachings as being the teachings which transcends the cycle of birth and death. Does, does this mean anything to you? Yes? What, does, what do you think? Buddhahood, okay. 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 Does this mean anything to you, Izumi? It's Kat Katrine. <laughs> okay, okay. It was very concise. Anybody else? One hour from?
Okay. About living? Okay. Okay. So then the third question then is what what does being born in Pure Land mean then? Is that about here and now or is that about in the future? And how to get there? Okay. What was that? Sorry. I think it's when to be born into a pillar is actually when you achieve. When you achieve? Yeah. Okay. Well, Here, that are no longer here. I'm here. Okay. It helps explain that they've gone somewhere. somewhere. Okay. So that uh, it makes you feel a little better. It's reassuring. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A little very interesting answer. Good answer. Well, you know, this is why, and I think that that's a very poignant point in that um, the reason why you can't just stop with the Eightfold Noble Path. Okay, this is why the Buddha had to go on and talk about more. Was that the fact that it wasn't enough for the followers just to say, here's a way to live uh, your life now. You don't have to worry about the future. Because the human nature says that well, we, we will worry about the future. No matter how much we're told, you have to just focus on what you're doing now. Human nature says that we will think about the future. And so it's not, you're not, it's not being unique to one individual. Um, you know what, that should actually come in later on. But uh, there were these seven really amazing monks. Uh, two of them in India, three in China, and two in Japan. They, we call them the seven patriarchs. And if anybody's interested, I have much more information on each one of them. And I, I leave them here. I didn't want to make your handouts bigger than they were already were, so I put them in separately. But uh, basically, there are four reasons why the, uh, Shin, uh, Shinan consider these uh, seven, why we call them the patriarchs. And one of them, the major reason is that they all had the desire to be born into Amida's pure land. And even though these seven monks were very accomplished monks in different areas of Buddhism, okay, they were highly knowledgeable, highly educated monks. In the end, they had this desire to be born in Amida's pure land. Why? Because they were, that was their human nature as well, is that there is something else. Okay? And that's also an aspect of Buddhism that has to be understood. So it's not something, it's not just a, a, a base teaching, meaning a shallow teaching to wanting to be born in pure land. It's in fact a very, I mean, such accomplished beings also had the same desire to be born. Okay? And this being, in fact, according to Shina Shoni, he, he sort of turns things completely upside down and he says, this desire to want to be born into the Pure Land, that's actually not your desire, but it's because of the working of the infinite on us that makes us want to go or want to be uh, born in the Pure Land. It's, the working of Amida itself that brings that desire within us. Okay. There are other reasons why they're, they're considered seven patriarchs. They all wrote commentaries or something regarding the Pure Land teachings. And they also um, added two concepts to it, advanced this ideology. And they are all are in agreement with the teachings themselves. So, that, so these were called the seven patriarchs, right? Um, and, and basically their teachings are the ones that 
um, the teachings that we follow. And, he, and when we look at Shinan's life itself, he too also follows this process. Okay? When we look at his early life, he spends 20 years on Mount Hie doing these very concrete practices, the Tendai practices, following this practice, this path. He's thinking, okay, I could follow this path. But then he comes to the point where he hits his barrier and says, no matter how hard I try, I can't rid myself of my ego. Right? I'm following this path, but I'm, I, I can't transcend this, the suffering I'm having. And that's when he comes to this awakening of something that is much more. And that was the, what he found through the, the writings on the Pure Land Sutras, Amida Buddha. And basically he encounters uh, his teacher, Hone Shoni, who was teaching a teaching for, for all beings. Right? So at the age of 29, he, he changes and he, be, he becomes a Nembutsu follower. And Honen was unique in that he, <coughs> he created a path. Uh, Honen, Shinan's teacher, the last of the seven patriarchs, he created the path that was independent in, in Japan, a uh, pure land path. He validated it as an independent path that one could follow. And Shinan became one of those followers. Right? And even after he um, encounters and becomes and then with a follower, he still has difficulties. And throughout his life, we, hear, we see repeatedly uh, Shinan sort of catching himself. He's saying, you know, oh, I was trying to chant a thousand times to help the people who were in the suffering around me and realize that that was my own ego. Right? And so he has to let go of that again. But if we look at um, Shinan's writings, in the very first part of his uh, Kyogyo Shinsho, his greatest work, Shinan goes on to say, right, I reflect within myself, the universe of all, dif difficult to fathom, is indeed a great vessel bearing us across the ocean, difficult to cross. The unhindered light is the sun of wisdom dispersing the darkness of our ignorance. It is that when conditions for the teaching of birth of the Pilan has matured, Devadatta provoked Ajatasatru to commit grave crimes. And when the fa opp opportunity arose for explaining the pure act by which birth is settled, Shakyamuni led Vaidehi to select the land of peace. In their selfless love, these incarnated ones, Devadatta, Ajatasatru, Vaidehi, all aspired to save the multitudes of beings from pain and affliction. And in his compassion, Shakyamuni, the great hero, sought indeed to bless those committing the five great offenses, those slandering the Dharma, and those lacking the seed of Buddhahood. We know, therefore, that the auspicious name embodying the perfectly fulfilled supreme virtues is true wisdom that transforms our evil into virtue, and that the diamond-like Shinji is so difficult to accept is true reality that sweeps away doubt and brings us attain <coughs> attainment of enlightenment. I don't want to cough because it's going to go into the mic. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, of course, um, Shinnan is expressing the fact that the ultimately the teachings of Shakyamuni existed for us to encounter. For those in our time, a time where it may be difficult to follow and practice the teachings as one could, would desire. In such a time, there is a path. And he said that all these individuals who come out in the teachings are there to lead us, guide us to this path of understanding. And that is the teachings of Amida Buddha. This then is the true teaching, easy to practice for small foolish beings. It is a straight way, easy to traverse for the dull and ignorant. Among all teachings, the great sage preached in his lifetime, none surpasses the ocean of virtues. Let the one who seeks to abandon the defiled and aspire for the pure, who is confused in practice and vacillating in faith, 
whose mind is dark and whose understanding deficient, whose evils are heavy and whose karmic obstructions manifold, let such person embrace above all the Tathagata's exhortations, take refuge without fail in the most excellent direct path, devote themselves solely to the practice, and revere only this Shinji. He's saying here, of course, in this time, for me, for Shinan, this is the only path, this Nembutsu path. It, it, it transcends um, all the teachings that tell me how to live my life because it is the foundation of my existence. Um, it is the path, letting go to this teaching is the most important thing for me, Shinan. This is what he's saying. In the end here, I'm just going to skip the, uh, the third passage. How joyous I am, Tokushin, disciple of Shakyamuni. Where is it to come upon sacred scriptures from the west, westward land of India and the commentaries of the masters of China and Japan. But now I have been able to encounter them. Where is it to hear them? But already I have been able to hear. Reverently entrusting myself to the teachings, practice, and realization that a true essence of Pure Land Way, I'm especially aware of the profundity of the Tathagata's benevolence. Here I rejoice in what I have heard and extol what I have attained. It's all right there. Shinran is saying for, for him that letting go just understanding, accepting these teachings as it is, was for him the path of liberation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we talk about this again. Um, Shina repeats this over and over in his teachings. And we see in the Tanisho, saved by the inconceivable working of Amida's vow, I shall realize birth in the pure land. The moment you entrust yourself thus to the vow, so that the mind set upon saying the nimbus arises within you, you are immediately brought to share in the benefit of being grasped by an Amida, never, never to be abandoned. Okay, so the moment that we're, we're awakened to this, the moment that we see, receive uh, the working of Amida Buddha, that instant is the, the, the point that's important in Jola Shishu. Not afterlife, okay. because Shina is saying, at that moment, that awakening, after that, whatever happens in life, both the good and the bad, okay, that happens in life, I know I'm within this, this compassion. And that, for Shina, was a very fundamental point. And this is where he revolutionized or... or uh, brought forward the Pure Land teaching from what it was before. This is something very unique about Shinran. He brought a concept that was very much for the afterlife. And in fact, in the Pure Land teachings, up until Shinran's times, uh, they had this whole process of, of deathbed rit rituals, of having an image of the Amida in front of you, tying strings from your hand to Amida's, of seven different colors and, and visualizing the Buddha coming to receive you at the time of death. And Shinran said, all that's not necessarily. Because the moment that you realize, awaken to the work, uh, working, that's the moment that you're reassured of, of your birth. When we think about this, how do we interpret that? When, we, when you think about it, when you think about our own lives even, the fact that here we are in Canada talking about a teaching that has taken so many individuals to pass on down to us, it really is hard to fathom that we're able to grasp this, understand it. So we're receiving all the benefits or, or all the the hopes of all those people that have gone before us. And I'm not talking about just Japanese. I'm talking about all the Chinese, all the, uh, the Indian, uh, you know, the, the people from India, because it was brought down from country to country to country. 
So when we think of all that, just for us to be able to receive this teaching, it is truly incredible. And, then, and if you expand that a little further, it's all the life that sustains me, that has allowed me to be here this evening, that allows us to be here this evening. So this is what Shino was aw awakened to. Okay. This is the working of Amida Buddha. It's that infinite which transcends time and space that works upon me right now. That says that we are part of this infinite. We are one with this infinite. And so that's what Shina is saying. The moment we awaken to that, that's the most important part. And for him, Shina comes to this realization, as for me, Shina, I simply accept the teachings of my teachers. Now, this word here, simply, is, um, is a translation that maybe is uh, not a, the best translation. Because sometimes we, when we think of simply, we think of something of ease. But in this, um, the original Japanese, um, it means that I completely accept. I totally, I solely accept the teaching of a teacher. In other words, Shinran in his own being has exhausted all the other possibilities. And there was only this left. Okay, so the, it's, it's not simply in the sense of, you know, uh, ease simply, but it's simply in that solely, this is the only path for him. He's exhausted all other paths as far as he, he was concerned. So as for me, I solely accept it and entrust myself to what my uh, revered teacher told me. Just say the Nembutsu and be saved by Amida. Nothing else is involved. He goes on and he explains that for him, um, he's incapable of doing any practice or any good. And for him, this was the only path that, tra that, that transcends uh, life and death. And when we look at his notes, in another part he says, True and real, pure Shinjin is the inner cause. Being grasped, never to be abandoned, abandoned is the outer cause. Concerning the entrusting of oneself to the primal vow, to borrow the words of Chantal, in the preceding moment, life ends. This means that one immediately enters the group of the truly settled. Okay, so what he's saying here is that what we call rebirth in China, and I'm going to sound like a born-again Christian, so I don't, I don't want people to misconstrue me in that. But Shina is saying, and this is from one of the masters in China, Chantal says, uh, <clears throat> In the preceding moment, life ends. Okay? And what he's referring to is not the end of life physically, but the end of, our, of one existence and the beginning of a new existence. And this is when we awaken to the Bodhi, the, the Bodhi mind, the, the mind of Amida. Okay? And that means that one immediately enters the group of truly settle. Uh, settle. So the way Shina viewed it is that being born in the Pure Land, physically, maybe at the time of death, but it's not necessarily the most important part, the physical part. The most important part is awakening to this mind of Amida. Okay? And um, <clears throat> this is why in Jodo Shinshu, for instance, uh, we don't if you follow one logic, okay, if you think the Pure Land is the uh, ultimate goal, then why not just commit suicide? Right? <laughs> it gets you there that much quicker. But Shina says, of course, you know, that's not the way to go. Right? Because it's not necessarily the physical birth into Pure Land that's important. It's the awakening here. Then everything after that becomes a life of gratitude.
Um, and finally, in the larger sutra, the most important sutra of Jodoshi, it does categorically state that the Buddha said to Ananda, just as karmic, karmic recompense is inconceivable, so it is that the worlds of the Buddhas are inconceivable. Sentient beings come to dwell in the land of karmic reward as a result of the meritorious act. So it does matter what you do in this life. Okay? Sometimes in, in, in Jodo Shinshu, we've been talk, we, we talk about the fact that Amida's compassion is infinite and boundless and therefore no matter what you do, you're grasping this embrace, the Buddha of infinite compassion. And, and from the perspective of the infinite, that might be so. But it doesn't mean we should take advantage of that. Okay, and in, in, in the teachings, um, and it comes out repeatedly, there are individuals who have misconstrued the teachings and said, you know, while well, I'm a, a being full of evil, I'm a, a I'm full of this karmic evil, and there's nothing I can do about it, so why even try? And, and, and what's important is know that Amida attained Buddhahood 10 kalpas ago, and now because of that, I'm, I basically am going to be uh, born in the Pure Land. And, and it doesn't say that in, in the large sutra. It does say you're born because of your meritorious acts. And what, what that means is, it does matter what you, your effort and what you do in your life. Okay? Listening to the teachings is the most meritorious act that you can do, or setting that direction, facing that direction. Okay? And so, bringing us all back to this concept of the um, quantum mechanics of Jodo Shinshu is that fact that, yes, on one hand, we do still have to follow what it says in the Noble Eightfold Path, because those things are important. They, it, it, it's very um, pragmatic, and it's also, it also gives us direction on how I should try to live my life. But at the same time, understand that I am limited. And no matter how hard I try, I have my faults, and I do fall down. And there is an aspect that says, you know what, even if we fall down, there is the infinite that's working upon me constantly, as I am, telling me who I am, as I am, accepting me, as I am, awakening me, as I am. And when we get that, that's what Sheena is talking about. Saved by the inconceivable working of Amida's vow, as I am. Okay. So even though, in fact, probably the harder you try to follow the noble eightfold path, the more you realize how faulty I am. Right. There's a, a famous. Um, story of, of the Kendall master. You may have heard um, of a student and his master and the, the student talks to his uh, teacher and said, if I practice two hours a day, how long will it take me to be a, a, a good grand master? And the, the master says, it'll take you two years. So then the uh, student says, well, if I practice four hours a day, how long will it take me? He said, it'll take you four years. And the, the student kind of thinks, well, that makes no sense. If I practice twice as hard, it's going to take me twice as long. And then he says, well, if I practice eight hours a day, how long will it take me to become a master? And the, and the master says, you will never become a master. And then, of course, the disciples think, that makes no sense. What the master was saying was that if you only practice two hours a day, your expectation of what a master is you'll achieve it in two years. Okay? If you practice four hours a day, you begin to understand there's a lot more to being what a master is, and it'll take you four years. If you practice eight hours a day, you'll realize how difficult what it truly is. And it's the same thing. The harder you try to perfect yourself, 
or try to follow the path, if you will, the more you realize your inner ego, the more you realize your self-centeredness. And at that time, then at the same time, you realize the greater working that's working upon us, even as I am with my faults. It doesn't negate the importance of that effort that you've been putting in. In fact, it's because of that effort you probably appreciate you're limited, right? So that's what Shinan is talking about here. And, and that, to me, is bringing in two very, one, a very concrete aspect to say, you know, this is a path that I can lead. And then the, by doing so, we, we, we receive what I would call the wave aspect, the, the, the aspect that has been transcended time. They've been passed on through the generations, through beyond the generations, what we call Amida, to me. And so that's, to me, the two aspects of, of Jodo Shinshu, is that the fundamental Buddhism is the very concrete, the particle aspect, but at the same time, it's been transcended by an infinite that's saying, even as I am, I'm being accepted, that, I, that I'm being awakened, despite who I am. I'm being awakened. In spite of who I am, I'm being awakened. So I thank you all. And I apologize. Um, I, as I said, I gave a five-hour lecture. There's a lot more detail in the seven patriarchs. I would have put you to sleep. I think when I started talking about the seven patriarchs, I did, some of the people in Seattle did start falling asleep. But I thank you. And are there any questions? No questions? No more windows. 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 No more windows.